At SECO Environmental, we're proud to be your single source for pollution control. It's our mission to protect our shared environment, and we relentlessly pursue that goal by providing reliable products and services to tackle your environmental challenges. Purchasing pollution control equipment can be a complicated process, particularly when you have a system that requires many different pieces of equipment. However, our vast range of technologies and solutions for pollution control and product recovery can eliminate that complexity, lowering your total cost of ownership without sacrificing performance. Across a wide variety of industries, SECO helps ensure you achieve real results. No matter your need, SECO has you covered. Simplify your environmental initiatives with our SECO Environmental family of industrial solutions brands. SECO Environmental is a global leader in air quality and fluid handling, serving the energy, industrial, and other niche markets. Through innovative technology and application expertise, SECO helps you grow your business with safe, clean, and more efficient solutions that help protect our shared environment. We work tirelessly to improve air quality, optimize the energy value chain, and provide custom engineered solutions for applications including oil and gas, power generation, water and wastewater, battery production, polysilicon fabrication, chemical and petrochemical processing, and more. To learn more, visit SecoEnviro.com today. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for the SECO Certified Continuing Education Series. Today we will be learning about Dust Collection Basics presented by SECO Environmental. My name is Mary Rusnak and I'm the Marketing Manager for the Industrial Air and Fluid Solutions segment of SECO. And with me today is Jeff Kovalik, Territory Sales Manager, and Brian Kovarik, Inside Sales and Service Manager for SECO FlexClean. While we wait for everyone to join, I'd like to go over some basic housekeeping items about our webinar platform and also the PDH certification. So let's start off with sound issues. So hopefully everyone can read this if you can't hear this. So obviously check your media player. Uh, you can also uh, see if it's muted or not. Take a look at the help widget, which is the uh, blue arrow with a little question mark on it. And then log out and log back in and you can still use the same link from the email that you got for registering. So biggest thing is typically just checking out the media player or logging back in and out. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see there are multiple application engagement tools or what I like to call widgets. Uh, all the widgets are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. You can also expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A widget. Keep ourselves on track. All questions will be held until the end of the presentation, but you can submit your questions at any time. If we don't get to your question, don't worry. Uh, we will answer all questions after the event if we don't get to them here live. So feel free, just keep asking questions and we'll definitely answer them for you. A copy of today's slide deck and additional help materials are available in the resource list. We encourage you to download any resources or links that you might find useful. If you notice, we have links in there for all of our social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube. We do post all of our events on LinkedIn and Facebook. And we also, um, you'll notice there is a summary there for dust collections, and that's something that anybody who's taking the PDH quiz, uh, that's something you might find useful, hint, hint. Uh, so something for you to definitely check out before the end of the presentation. Uh, there's also some information on the PDH uh, states that we actually are able to offer right now. We're offering uh, in 36 states that it's available for. And then, Basically, just take a look. If you hover over any of the widgets, it'll basically tell you what they are. So you can do a couple things. You can share, you can email us directly from the platform. Uh, you know, probably really the most important things that you wanna take a look are the last two, which is um, if, if you're doing the PDH portion, the test here widget and the track here widget. 
that's where you're going to find um, all the information you need for that PDH. So at the end of the presentation, we'll be able to take the test, and you'll actually be able to print out a certificate straight from the platform. So webinars are bandwidth intense, so I recommend that everybody um, close down any other applications or windows that you have op open. It will help you. If you find that your slides are lagging behind, you can push F5 on your keyboard, and that will refresh the page. I've also found that Chrome seems to be the best browser for this application, so if you're having issues, just log out and log back in with Chrome. Uh, you can also find, obviously, the additional uh, answers to some common technical things through that help widget that I talked about before. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available after the event and can be accessed using the same link that you got when you registered. So all the interactivity remains, including all the testing capabilities, so if you get logged out, it's easy enough to log back in and finish everything up. Today's webinar is worth one professional development hour. You must be present for at least 50 minutes of this presentation, and you need to pass and complete the test at the end, getting eight out of 10 right. When you're done, you'll be able to print, the, uh, uh, print a certificate that shows you completed the course, and you just want to use that certification widget that I talked about. Um, I recommend that everyone keep a log for themselves, but obviously feel free to contact me if you need any additional materials or if you have any other questions. The webinar is one hour long, but I'm going to keep the platform open for an additional 30 minutes after the event is done to allow everybody to complete the, uh, the quiz and um, print out any materials that they may need. In the webinar today, we're going to talk about a couple of different things, but starting off with really just a de de definition, basic overview, with a specific focus on the Pulse Jet. We'll go into operation, design considerations, characteristics, troubleshooting, and even get to some examples. Before we do that, let's start off with a poll question, and you will be able to put your answer in the next slide. So how much experience do you have with dust collectors? And I'm an expert. I have some experience. I have a little experience. What in the world is a dust collector? Here's where you can put your answers, and we'll give everybody a few seconds to input their selections. All right, and let's see what we have in our audience today. Okay, we've got a, a lot of people that have just a little bit of experience or, you know, don't even really know what a dust collector is. So this is great. This is definitely a fundamental basic course. So I think you're going to get a lot out of this. So I'm going to pass this now on to Brian, who is going to start off the presentation. Brian? Thanks, Mary. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, so start off with just what is a dust collector? Dust collectors are separation devices that use the principle of filtration via filter media to remove particulate matter from the gas or air streams. Also called bag houses, which we hear a lot, and you may refer to them as, they are typically used to remove particulate dust matter as a result of a manufacturing process. This can involve product recovery, nuisance dust control, and thin or silo venting. Depending upon your application, they would operate downstream of cyclones for finer particulate filtration. Let's kind of move into some common terms. We have a lot of, we call it industry terms. Um, so you may, when talking about it, stuff as reference to. Um, so the first one is SCFM, which stands for standard cubic feet per minute. Um, this is just the gas flow reduced to standard temperature, um, which is usually 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and a standard pressure is one ATM. ACM, ACFM is actual cubic feet per minute at the actual condition temperature pressure, moisture, elevation, and gas composition of the process. Differential pressure, which you'll hear a lot in dust collection, is a, the change in pressure, or we can refer to it as pressure drop, that occurs from the inlet to the outlet of a dust collector. Usually a, a magnet helix gauge or some kind of gauge is connected to the, the DAP dirty air plenum or CAP clean air plenum to measure this. Operating pressure is typically measured in water column. It is the resistance that air encounters while traveling through the ducting and the collector. And again, again, the can velocity and interstitial velocity, where 
a lot of times the terms are intertwined and used, call it incorrectly. Um, so kind of in, this, in the industry, I guess. The cam velocity is the upward airstream speed passing between the filters and a dust collector with filter elements suspended from the tube sheet. It calculated at the horizontal cross-sectional plane of the collector housing at the bottom of the filters. Interstitial velocity is the upward velocity of the air through the open air between the filter bags inside a dust collector. Upward of velocity occurs when the hopper inlet is used on a pulse jet bag house. And again, so sometimes these uh, terms can intertwine and be incorrectly referred to. So some more common terms. I don't know if you see the pictures here, the bag cup and a venturi. Um, the bag cup is just a circular cup that is installed on the tube sheet, uh, usually in bottom load collectors that the venturis are also installed to and the bags clamp onto. A venturi has many different references. You'll hear some people call them cones or horns, um, but the, the actual name of them are venturis. They're a cone-shaped device located at the top of each filter in a pulse jet dust collector into which the compressed air is blown into. A negative pressure at the top of the venturi is created during pulsing to help pull additional air volume into the filter element. This basically discharges the air and creates the, the path of it to, through the filter to complete the cleaning. So, and then pulse jet is just the cleaning method where a momentary burst of compressed air is introduced through the tube or blowpipe or nozzle at the top of the cap of a filter bag. Um, generally, you have two different kinds of uh, pulsing ways to do it. So you can do a continuous pulse or pulsing on demand. So a continued pulse refers to just pulsing on time. So you'll have an on time and an off time. Um, generally, your on time is about 50 milliseconds, and your off time can range depending on your air permits and your, your just your production and your needs from anywhere, usually from, you know, 5 to 15 seconds. Generally, it's 10 seconds. And all that means is that every 10 seconds, you're going to be pulsing one row of uh, the dust collector. So we have an on time of real quick 50 millisecond pulse, and then you'll have a 10 second delay before it moves on to the next row. And it continuously does this as long as the unit is on and it never changes. Pulsing on demand is something where you pulse based upon differential pressure. So you would have a high point and a low point set. You're usually between you know two inches of water and five inches of water but this really depends on your air permit also and what you're allowed to do and the way that works is that you'll be you'll have your same on and off time but it won't pulse continuously it'll only pulse when the high point of the differential pressure is set so if you have a set of five inches of water it will not begin pulsing until you hit that you bring that differential pressure up to five inches of water and then it'll continuously pulse until it gets down to your low setting, which might be two inches of water, and then it stops and it does not again pulse again until you reach that five inches of water again. Um, dust loading is very important factor in um, sizing the collector that you know you'll hear later on. Um, it just refers to the rate at which partic particles are emitted in the airstream from a pollution source. We measure these in grains per cubic foot, pounds per hour, pounds per minute. Um, Air to cloth ratio is the ratio of volume to square feet of the effective filter media. Um, so for an example, if you had 6,000 ACFM coming into your unit and you had 1,500 square feet of media um, of your filters, your air to cloth ratio would be four to one. Generally, uh, pulse jets with filter bags and cages, we strive for a ratio of between four to one to six to one. And pulse jets with pleated or cartridge type filters is usually somewhere between two to one to four to one. Um, filter cake is the accumulation of dust on a filter bag before cleaning. This cake buildup increases filtration efficiency by helping to capture more particulate from the airflow. Um, if you ever hear the word seasoning a bag or anything like that, that's all it really means here is that you're establishing a filter cake. Um, on the outside of the bag for increased efficiency and performance. Diaphragm valve is a valve where air pressure is applied through a pilot valve into an actuator, which in turn raises the diaphragm and opens the valve. And then a good old solenoid valve is an electromechanical device that is used for controlling liquid or gas flow. Um, here's a picture of a kind of an arrangement and some of uh, the terms of that. If you ever hear cap, it just refers to the clean air plumb, and that's just the top section that has the pulsing system, the air headers and pulse valves and everything like that. 
um, the blowpipes, and the exhaust outlet. The DAP is the, the much bigger, longer uh, middle section, which is the dirtier plenum, which can, contains the filters and sometimes a support grid to, for easy access. Um, the hopper on the bottom is the lower section with either conical, trop, or pyramidical shape containing airflow inlet and the discharge opening. And see the inlet there is where the airstream and the dust is gonna enter the dust collector. And then we have what's called dust contact versus gas contact. So you can have applications that may require gas contacts for stainless steel, right? That just means that anything that air touches is gonna be stainless steel. So your entire unit then would be stainless steel versus dust contact, you know, if that had to be stainless steel for the dust contact, then and your dirty air plenum, you would have to have that stainless steel, but your clean air plenum could just be your regular carbon seal and your cages could be carbon seal because dust would not be touching that at all. Okay, and then last couple here are uh, for the tube sheet. It's a flat plate that basically uh, divides the clean air plenum and the dirty air plenum. And this is where the bags are suspended from. So, and then on the TBR, which you'll hear a lot, it just stands for top bag removal. This just means that you can install the filter bags from the top of the tube sheet. You basically snap them into the top of them and then drop them in from above the tube sheet. The BBR is the bottom bag removal system. It install filters from below the tube sheet. That's where you have the bag cups, the venturis, and then you have the filter bags and cages that you put up to the tube sheet and you clamp into place. So, Moving on, um, I'll bring in my colleague, Jeff Kovalik here, and he'll kind of start going over the dust collector operations and, and some design. Okay, Brian, thank you very much. So what we want to take a look back, uh, look here on, <clears throat> on this particular slide is we're going to run through the, the basic operation of a dust collector. And if you recall back on slide 10, we define what a dust collector is. But here we're actually going to show you now how exactly it operates. And essentially what you're going to see here is, is that the air is going to enter a collector, typically from an inlet in the hopper section. The air is going to hit what's called an internal strike plate or a target baffle plate. It'll become turbulent at that point, and the air will begin to rise up into the filter section. The air uh, at that point is either going to be pushed or pulled into this collector, uh, known as either positive pressure if the air is being pushed or negative pressure if it's being pulled by a fan. Um, once this air is inside the collector and it begins to rise up into your filter bags, you're going to then see where the filtration process starts to happen. The air is going to actually start to flow through the bags and back on that dust cake term that you heard before, the dust is going to start to collect on the outside of your filter bags and that coupled with the filter media is going to actually be your filtration surface. And so the air then is going to start passing through these filters into the cage and it's going to then pass right up through those and it's going to go through the holes in the tube sheet. And then that's where your air is cleaned and your air, clean air is subsequently going to exhaust then out of your clean air plenum. And that's the basic way that a dust collector operates. So next, let's talk a little bit, though, about, you know, does every dust collector look the same? And the answer to that question, of course, is no. They come in arrangements. As you see here, we've got basically three arrangements. Arrangement one involves just the clean air plenum and the tube sheet. Arrangement two is the clean air plenum, tube sheet, and dirty air plenum. And then arrangement three just adds a hopper to the bottom. Now, where you'll typically see arrangement one and arrangement two collectors installed will be on things such as silos, bins, hoppers, maybe even over grinders or crushers, essentially where the dust is probably going to be returned back into the process. When you get into an arrangement three um, and you start adding a hopper, of course, you can still have the same scenario of adding dust back into the process but you also introduce that the dust may then be collected into an external container for disposal, or it may go down into a pneumatic conveying system and be you know, pushed to somewhere else in the plant.
but essentially um, every dust collector that we're going to be talking about that you're going to see is going to be one of these three different arrangements or a combination as such. Okay, and we have a timely poll question here about arrangements, and again, you'll be able to answer the question in the next slide. So for all of you that are uh, have some systems within your um, plants or facilities, what type of arrangements are you currently using? And you can choose as many as apply, or you can hit D if it doesn't apply to you. And here's where you put your answers. All right, give everybody another five seconds or so to pick everything that they are using, and let's see what, what everyone has within their facilities. Okay, so we have a lot of arrangement sprees, which I think we all had uh, discussed as, you know, at some point that that's the most common, correct, uh, Jeff? That's the one that's most often seen? That's correct, Mary. All right, guys, thank you, and back to Jeff. Okay. Um, one thing to also note when you look at arrangements, arrangement one and arrangement two, you are going to notice that they don't have an inlet, a typical inlet into the hopper section. And again, the reason behind that is, is just the nature of how the collector is being used in the application. Okay, now we're gonna kind of get into the meat of things. Um, you've heard now about terminology and we've kind of run through the anatomy, but now let's look at the key design parameters which need to be considered and determining for specifying a collector for any application you're likely going to see this info laid out perhaps on a data sheet that maybe a vendor would supply, basically used to capture this information in a concise manner. So it doesn't necessarily have to be labeled this way, but we're just going to run through the outline as we've got it here. First part of a consideration is what material of construction do you require on your collector? As you can see, there's multiple materials of construction that a collector can come in, and there's even further more than this. But these are the most common ones that we see being requested by customers and used in the various applications. Just a quick note here, Duplex 2205 is a stainless steel uh, material, and it also has some magnetic properties as well. Next is location. You might simply think, well, indoors and outdoors, but there's a little bit more to this. Elevation, seismic zone, wind and snow load are all important factors as well, whether your collector is going to be designed for an indoor or outdoor installation. And for example, we typically would design an indoor collector um, for just a seismic zone, but only for indoor. We wouldn't take into account any kind of wind or snow load since that wouldn't apply. So therefore, your design uh, on your legs, perhaps, may not be as robust as it might be if the, the collector were in the same uh, location, but it was then going to be outdoors, subjected to the environment. Uh, and of course, then you can talk about paints, et cetera, as well, that might be needed, or protection methods. Um, next, application specifics. Where is the collector actually going to be used? Is it going to be for a silo vent or as a bin vent? Is it a filter receiver coming off of rail car loading? Uh, is it going to be a nuisance control application where you've just got a lot of dusting, fugitive dusting, and you just need to clean up the work area? Uh, product reclamation, is it going to be kind of a closed loop system where you're returning the collected dust back into the process? And then of course, do you require support legs? And if so, what kind of clearance might you need for the support legs to access under your hopper discharge? Or do you require an access platform to actually get to the collector? How is it going to be supported? How is it going to be accessed to get to the filter bags for maintenance, et cetera? Uh, next consideration is temperature. We typically you know, work in just degrees Fahrenheit, but Lower temperature versus higher temperature will have an effect on the types of gasket or the types of paint finish, and certainly the filter media that needs to be used within the dust collector. And then another consideration with temperature is does the collector require insulation 
Are you going to be worried about condensation, moisture? Depending upon where you're located, indoors, outdoors, is it going to be subjected to a lot of temperature swings? Okay, next is pressure. Again, very important factor here because not only does this, this talks about the operating pressure of the collector, which means that you have to take into account what is the pressure going to be at the inlet of the collector or the pressure for a fan if you're specifying a fan as well if you're under a negative application. Typically measured in inches of water column, inches of mercury, or PSI. Again, the pressure involves from the pickup point all the way through to the fan, including the pressure drop across the bags, cages, and tube sheet as well. Um, certainly you want to make sure that your fan is sized appropriately and that you have enough uh, or you have sufficient room you know, for any potential uh, maybe future growth if that's something that you're looking at or that you're just certainly sized appropriately for your application. Um, air to cloth ratio, again, we talked about that, but basically five to one is a, is a general target. Again, it can vary upon the application and the type of collector. And quickly, it's just to remind you, it's the amount of filter square footage in relation to the airflow. Again, important to understand in design consideration because you don't want to, you know, you want to make sure that you have your system in balance. And, and that, that balance means that you want to make sure that you're able to have enough filter cloth area to actually sustain and maintain the performance that's necessary for actually removing the dust particulate from the airstream. Um, interstitial velocity, and again, Brian touched on that previously, but talking again about the upward airflow between the filter media, this really is a, is a key component because if you've got too high of an interstitial velocity, you'll push your particulate up into the filter bags and you'll never allow it to drop out, subsequently subjecting your, your bags to possible overloading of dust, possible um, blinding of your bags too early, and again, a system not in balance. And as we said, it's typically measured in feet per second or feet per minute. And is can velocity the same? The answer, of course, is, is no, as Brian alluded to earlier, but it does get used uh, interchangeably with interstitial velocity. But if for this purposes, we are talking about interstitial velocity as a more, uh, a more appropriate design consideration. Okay, I'm going to move on to several more design considerations. The dust, probably one of the most important factors. You're obviously installing a dust collector or you need a dust collector system and you have to deal with your dust in your application. What's going to be important to know in order to size your collector appropriately? Key parameters are going to be what's the bulk density? What's the weight of the dust? And we like to look at this in kind of a worst-case scenario, uh, not so much in a packed configuration, but what's the bulk density going to be in a loose configuration? What's the particle size? And the particle size plays a role in your filtration. Um, the bulk density plays a role in how you handle the dust coming into the dust collector. If you've got a light bulk density with small particles, you probably are going to want to look at maybe a higher inlet or potentially some sort of different configuration of how that dust becomes introduced into the collector. Uh, dust loading also plays a role because the amount of dust in the airstream coming into the collector is also very important to understand. Typically, as I mentioned previous, it's measured in grains or measured in pounds per hour or per minute, uh, grains per cubic foot, excuse me. But dust loading can vary widely, just as particle size can vary widely. But it is important uh, consideration because dust loading can really affect how the bags are going to be subjected to the amount of dust. And then, of course, how much material needs to drop out, um, how much you're going to be collecting or processing, etc. And then other characteristics of the dust is what, what is the, uh, how is the dust actually perform or how does it, uh, you know, when it comes into your dust collector, what's going to happen with it? Is there potential for it to agglomerate 
or to clump together? Is it hydros hygroscopic? You know, will it potentially hold moisture or attract moisture? Is it sticky? Uh, you know, do you have to worry about it potentially sticking to the sides of the collector or what we call bridging so that it doesn't actually allow the dust to filter out through the hopper or through the bottom part of the collector? Uh, of course, is, can it be abrasive or is it corrosive? Uh, again, bera uh, if it's an abrasive type dust, you have to look at a specific type of filter media perhaps. You may also want to consider that you might need a separate uh, or you need some sort of internal protection to protect the collector walls from abrading or from wearing out. Uh, of course, corrosive, acidic kind of speaks for itself. But again, it's important to know that and to understand. And then lastly, but certainly not least, is, is the dust explosive? Uh, we're seeing this happening more and more in applications where dust is combustible. Um, typically, uh, when we talk about corro uh, combustible dust, we're going to talk about values called KST and Pmax. And I'll get into those a little bit further uh, down the line here. But essentially, these are the key parameters to know about your dust. If these are foreign to you or you're not aware of what they are, um, there are agencies, third-party companies out there that you can send your dust to, and they can test it for the explosivity, and they will provide you with these KST and Pmax values, and we highly recommend that. Um, next to move on to is the filter media. The filter type that you use in your collector is also extremely important. Essentially, there's three types of filter. You have your filter bags or socks, as you may hear them called. Then you have a pleated filter, or you have a cartridge filter. A pleated filter is typically a, hor a vertical installation, and a cartridge filter is typically a horizontal installation. Next is filter efficiency. Uh, this can be you know, referred to many people kind of can get kind of confusing about what does filter efficiency mean and how, how do I understand it? How do I know it? Uh, basically, what you're talking about here is, you know, how much particulate removal out of the airstream can we obtain? And this may be defined by uh, an emission or an air permit standard. Uh, typically, you're you know, like a health and environmental or safety person within a plant is going to have a better idea of what you need to accomplish here or what types of standards uh, you may need to meet or what we call an emission level. Um, and, you know, you typically look at it and say, is there kind of a standard emission that we're allowed or is there a higher emission or a higher efficiency rate that we need to meet to keep our efficiency rate within check? Uh, next then, of course, is, is what is, uh, if, if you understand what kind of filters you need, What's the filter removal type that you prefer for your collector? Do you want your employees or your maintenance personnel that are going to be responsible for the upkeep of the dust collector, do you want them to remove the filters from the dirty side of the uh, collector known as a bottom bag removal? And this literally means opening a door and stepping into the dirty air plenum where all of that dust has been accumulating and is stuck onto the filter bags, and, and it can be quite nasty. Or you can, you know, work from what's called the top bag removal, TBR, which basically there are two styles. You have lift-off roof doors or you have a walk-in clean air plenum. And again, you're on the clean air side. And we highly typically always recommend trying to do TBR as much as possible. The considerations for the difference between which type is more applicable for your application Maybe to just consider whether you're indoors or out, what environment or location you are in, what kind of weather you may be subject to, and then are there any clearance or height issues that you have to concern yourself with? Because in a uh, liftoff roof door TBR design, for example, your employee is going to literally be standing on the roof of the collector. Or with a walk-in plenum design, you're going to basically extend your clean air plenum to be high enough not only for a person to walk into, but to also pull the bags and cages up and out of the tube sheet holes and to be able to remove them. So there can be a height or a clearance issue there. Um, next is the electrical area classification, and this goes hand in hand with the type of dust that you're using. 
because if you're in a combustible dust or a non-combustible dust application, that will determine whether you, you know, need to be, um, your electrical classification needs to be rated as such. But the typical classifications you will see will be a NEMA 4, a NEMA 4X, NEMA 479, or ATEX. And ATEX is more of a European type certification or classification. And then within those classifications, uh, you, will, you will hear about classes, groups, and divisions as well. So for example, class one, you know, or class two, et cetera. Uh, next and finally is the general design standard of the collector. Typically here at FlexClean, when we are looking at say a standard design, we will specify that as a vendor, we have standard manufacturing procedures and standard welding procedures that we adhere to. So we will label it or list it as a Flex Clean Plus, the welding standard that we follow. And again, these are industry standards. Or if your situation is that you require an ASME pressure vessel, we will again follow the normal design standards that we employ, plus we will incorporate the necessary ASME pressure vessel code standards. So general design standards, again, just kind of encompass your welding, your fabrication, your quality control, et cetera. And then lastly, uh, on another design consideration is once you've determined all of these different aspects of what your dust collecting system is going to require, it's going to possibly involve auxiliary components. Uh, an airlock, for example. Is your dust going to have to pass through an airlock, which is typically connected to the bottom uh, opening or what we call the hopper discharge opening? Do you require a fan? Again, is the fan going to be something in a negative pressure application so it's pulling air, or is there going to be a fan upstream of the collector somewhere pushing air through it? Do you require a screw conveyor? Typically found on a trough hopper, not necessarily always on a trough hopper, but typically found there. Again, it just conveys the dust away from the dust collector to a, another subsequent point. Uh, a slide gate or a level sensor. Again, typically in a hopper, this is just a sensor that can provide the amount of dust accumulation within the hopper. Um, BBD is a broken bag detector or otherwise known as a particulate sensor. can be installed typically on the outlet of the dust collector, uh, upstream of the fan, downstream of the exhaust outlet. And again, it just measures the particulate uh, that's actually in the airstream. Very important piece of equipment to know if you have, end up having an issue with your bags that you're not aware of where you might be seeing excessive dust escaping perhaps either through improperly installed bags or a hole uh, in the filter bags, then the broken bag detector will, will pick up that, any kind of increase in particulate and it can be alarmed. Um, hopper vibration, again, just for any, if you've got a dust that tends to be kind of sticky or agglomerating, you know, this will literally vibrate the sides of the hopper to allow that dust to flow more freely down into the hopper discharge area and exit the collector. Uh, access ports, just you can have them in all the different plenums if you want to be able to just go in and in, do a, typical inspections just to check on the collector from time to time. Uh, poke hole, typically just a, like a three or four inch uh, diameter pipe on an angle in, a, in a, the bottom part of the hopper. Again, the, you can just run a stick or something down in there or you can look to see if, you know, if you're seeing the dust possibly building up or just needs to kind of be cleared out. And then sprinklers, again, you find these typically used more in certainly combustible dust type applications as part of a fire protection uh, type assembly. Okay, so let's move into next. You know, in any collector system, the primary objective is going to be to collect dust. And we want to take a look at dust or more specifically also referred to as particulate matter. And the 
in any case that you're going to hear, the typical term is, is that dust is typically listed in as microns. You might hear micrometers, you might hear millimeters, you might hear mesh size, but micron is the typical industry term. And um, you can see here that the typical unit for particle size uh, of a micron is one millionth of a meter, so extremely small. Um, and then you can see here, so why does particulate size matter? Well, number one, it can have issues with causing safety problems, um, both for workers or potentially, you know, just the general public if you have dust escaping, too much dust escaping uh, out into the air. Um, and so, you know, when we look at this, we have to be concerned with how are we filtering the particulate matter out of the airstream? What's the best way to do it? What's the particular, what's the best filter media as well? So um, when we look at particulate matter, you see here that the, the biggest concern to human and animal health is any particles that are typically less than 10 microns in size. Uh, here's just an example of just a quick diagram to kind of show you, you know, some of the more common uh, things that we might see in life, you know, how, how, what does a micron mean? How do you actually extrapolate it into a measurement? The typical human hair is approximately 50 to 70 microns in size. Um, you can see sand is approximately 90 microns. So just to give you an, a quick idea here of what does a micron actually mean or, or how do I actually extrapolate the size of it. Okay, next let's move into quickly into filter media types. Um, you know, we've already learned that a dust collector works by filtration of the dust, but the, the way you actually capture that dust by the, using the proper filter media is an extremely important aspect. And different medias have different effects on how they work, both within temperature and also on the, app, the process application. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but you can certainly see here on this chart um, the medias that are listed there are the most common medias that we see being utilized in dust collectors. And you can see there the max temperature ranges typically for these. Now you, you will see potentially that some of these filter bags can be used in maybe a slightly higher temperature, what we call a surge. But for the most part, we are talking about a typical normal operating temperature that's a continuous temperature. And that's typically how we select the appropriate medium. But again, you know, temperature is going to be one of the most important factors on selecting your media. And then of course, it's going to be on your filtration performance. Okay, one last thing that we have seen here when it comes to selecting and designing a dust collector is the fact that more and more applications are, um, are revolving around combustible dusts. And as a result, many companies now have to ensure that their dust collectors become NFPA compliant and that they follow the guidelines and standards to ensure a safe working environment. So here we're going to just briefly discuss the most common protection methods seen on a dust collector. And again, the important point here is, is that we're talking about protection only on the dust collector. So for example, if you had a bin vent on a silo and you were dealing with a combustible dust, we as a vendor cannot provide the, the uh, fire protection for the bin or the silo. We are only going to be providing it for the dust collector itself. So that is an important point to be aware of. But the most important point about being compliant with NFPA is understanding your dust. Do you know what your KST and Pmax value is? Have you had your dust actually tested by an accredited lab that can determine the KST and the PMAX or the MIE or the MEC. These are all just terms that have to deal with the explosivity values of your dust. And they are key in determining what the proper protection is that's going to be required. So for example, passive suppression. Some dust collectors will require flameless venting if they're installed indoors or there will require rupture panel type vents, as you'll see there on the picture to the left, for outdoor applications. Typically, the designation between indoor and outdoor 
uh, is going to be flameless venting on the inside, normal rupture panel venting on the outside, but that's not necessarily um, uh, a, you know, a fact that you just adhere to uh, so solidly here because you can use rupture panel venting on an indoor collector, but what you do have to be aware of is that that has to somehow be ducted to the outside. Typically, we refer to a dust collector or we'll want to know if a dust collector is within three feet of an outside wall um, or if not, uh, you know, so that it can be ducted appropriately, and that's typically going to be done, you know, by others, but that is a key consideration. And then, um, you know, is there chemical suppression required? You know, use of a chemical suppressant that acts in relation to detection of a pressure that's being generated by a potential fire uh, or do you need an isolation device, you know, to be put on the inlet and the outlet duct, et cetera, to contain that uh, potential e explosion or deflagration within the actual collector itself? And, and all of this NFPA compliance protection methods that are employed on a dust collector are all kind of governed by these NFPA explosion protection standards. And these were established to eliminate death, injury, property, and economic loss due to fire, electrical, and rated hazards. They're recommendations, but they're not the law. Um, these are typically enforced by an authority having jurisdiction within your plant. And that person could be somebody like a fire marshal or your insurance company or some other professional. So while these are not the law, um, they are strict recommendations and guidelines that, for the most part, everyone follows and everyone designs to. And you can find these standards online for free, or you can become a member uh, of the NFPA as well. Um, they can be a little uh, interesting. Uh, they can be quite uh, interesting to try and read through and try and pull information out. There's a lot of information, and they can be a little confusing at the same time. And then lastly here is just some ideas, just quickly, just to show you that uh, and to wrap up that combustible dust is, is truly an, ex an explosion hazard. You know, there have lives have been lost, and I'm sure we've probably all heard about uh, various uh, scenarios. Uh, but if you've ever experienced uh, an explosion of dust within your plant, you, you would know what, you, what we're talking about. It is not something to take lightly. It is a very serious issue. Uh, we as a vendor take it as a very serious issue. Um, you know, liability is a main concern for this, and it is something that, um, you know, we always strive to make sure that we design and err to the side of safety, as it is always a uh, best practice to be safer now than sorry later. And then, of course, uh, on the left side is just a quick example of a chemical suppression putting out a fire as well, and then there's a quick picture of a dust collector showing uh, rupture panel venting. Thank you, Jeff. And let's take a moment here to talk on, before we get into some troubleshooting, uh, for another poll question, and you'll be able to answer in the next slide. Do you handle your own maintenance and troubleshooting, or do you hire an outside contractor? And have a couple options there, in-house, outside, or you do both. And here's where you can put your answers. Okay, and we're going to finish up here, and let's take a look and see. Oh, wow, okay. 100% are doing in-house, in so that's great. I'm going to pass this on to Brian now, who's going to go into some of the troubleshooting that is involved within um, a collection. Brian? Thanks, Mary. Yeah, so just like any other equipment, you know, dust collectors do require maintenance, and we all want them to work perfectly all the time, and sometimes things change in designs or in processes, and things happen that, you know, may upset the balance or something like that. So, you know, we put together a little, little spiel here of troubleshooting. Um, but what, you know, the kind of most common um, issues that we see or that you may occur just from, you know, 
you know, things in your process happening or anything like that that can just kind of, you know, get things out of whack and everything. So, you know, the most com- one of the most common things we see is you have an ex- excessive pressure drop across the filter bags. Um, the differential pressure gauge on your dust collector should read, you know, four inches of water or less, ideally. Um, higher readings or steadily increasing readings are an indication that the main airflow through the dust collector may be restricted. And potential process problems such as poor suction at the duct pickup point may exist. Um, in extreme cases, if you get over the, the design pressure of, you know, generally standard 17 inches of water, you know, filter bags and cages could get crushed and damaged, and you can actually uh, do major damage to the shell of the unit as well. So, um, so what are some things that can cause this uh, excessive pressure drop? Um, is the pressure gauge working? Check, you always want to check the differential pressure gauge and the tubing leading to the dust collector. You disconnect the lines at the gauge and clear it with compressed air. Look for any loose fittings, cracked, broken, or pinched tubing. Make sure the gauge is leveled, zeroed, and contains the correct fluid. And also, you always want to make sure that you are you're calibrating that and checking that your magnet helix gauges is working properly. Um, check, you know, check the pulsing system if that's if your gauge is working properly. Um, if none of the solenoid valves are operating, you want to check the timer to make sure the wiring is correct and the timer has power. If that's the case, then we move on and want to check the air pressure at the header. It should recover to about 90 to 100 PSI for bags and cages and 50 to 60 PSI for pleated filters before each pulse. If not, check to make sure that the compressed air supply system is in good operating condition. It's correctly sized and the supply lines are not too small or restricted. Listen for the sound of compressed air flowing continuously through one or more of the rows of the bags, which is an indication of a valve or valves being stuck in a pulsing position. Usual causes for this condition are leaking and tubing to the solenoid pilot valve and dirt or oil in the solenoid or diaphragm valves. Also for the pulsing system, you also want to check that all the solenoid valves are firing in sequence by holding a finger over each solenoid exhaust port. Those are the for the pulsing system. Um, if you have water or oil in the compressed air, these are always a big difference. These dust collectors are designed to use dry dust. So any kind of water, oil, any kind of moisture introduced into it can cause issues. Um, always want to inspect the upper portions of the filter bags for dust caking, dampness, or oil. If any or all of these symptoms are, are indications of moisture, in the compressed air supply. Install equipment that will ensure a continuous supply of clean, dry, oil-free compressed air. Blinded bags. Collectors that sometimes have blinded bags or cake bags, as you can kind of see in the picture there, um, they, they're just not filtering anymore and you're not able to decrease your differential pressure. One way to do it to see if you can save them or, you know, is to put them into service by running the pulsing air system for 15 to 30 minutes with a three second off time and make sure that the main fan or blower is not running. After you do this, if the pressure drop is not lower than what it was before and you cannot maintain that lower pressure drop, the bags are, are not salvageable and will need to be changed. If the dust is not discharging from the hopper, you got to check for the hopper for overloading or bridging across the dust discharge. Correct by repairing dust discharge equipment, replacing with higher capacity equipment, or installing hopper vibrators as required to keep the hopper clear. What if the airflow is too high? If the main airflow is too high to allow dust to drop off of the filter bags, an excessive pressure drop across the dust collector will result and dust will build up in the system. In many cases, the high pressure drop in turn leads to a reduction in the main airflow, so that is necessary to remove the dust accumulation from the bags and the rest of the system before measuring the main airflow volume. Visually inspect the bags for heavy caking. If the caking is evident, you're going to same process as before is by running the system without the fan or blower to see if you can remove the caking and continue operation as is. If that's not the case, then you want to measure the main airflow with a pitot tube or equivalent device of a pitot tube and compare it with the original volume for which the unit was designed. If the flow is too high, you want to cut back the main fan to prevent a recurrence of this problem. Particle size and dust load. If possible, compare the dust particle size and loading with the original design specification 
spiner may cause pressure tights. If there's any moisture in the cut collector, again, it's not designed to be that way. So inspect the dust collector housing for leaks, uh, duct work holes, cracks, loose gasketing where water could enter the collector. If moisture has been considered in the collector, check the dew point temperature of the incoming airstream. It may be necessary to insulate the collector duct work keep the surface temperature from coming. So what happens if you have an extremely low pressure job? Well, same thing, is the pressure gauge working? You're gonna check the gauge, and make sure that the tubes leading to the dust collector are, on this, are this clear with compressed air, just as we did previously. The main culprit is probably that the, the filters either have holes in them or the bags were not entered correct, installed correctly. Inspect the filter bags for holes. If you see holes, this is just going to let air bypass and the dust bypass right through the bags and right up into your clean air plenum and probably out the atmosphere or into your plant. This, is, this will result in a very low pressure drop. The same thing with installation of the bags. If the bags are not installed correctly, they will generally have some kind of leakage that may disrupt the, 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 the flow and have the dust go through there, resulting in also a low pressure drop. So what if you have basically visible emissions? You have dust coming out of your stack or you have dust coming out too much from wherever. Um, again, so the most common thing is gonna be the holes in the filter bags or the bags are incorrectly installed because you're letting that dust and you're letting that air flow through there and vent out the atmosphere. Um, another thing you wanna do is check the tube sheet for holes, cracks, loose bolts, loose bag cup assemblies and bottom bag removal units that would prevent the dust permit the dust to bypass the filters. Uh, sometimes it's as simple as just gonna have to put a, a silicone around the, uh, the back cup just to seal it again. What if the air pressure is too high? Check the air pressure, hair head of pressure gauge. If your pulsing air pressure is over 100 PSI, the bags may flex excessively and not allow fine dust to pass through the bag material. What if they're worn filter bags? Inspect the filter bags for wear. Thin bags may not stop fine dust when flexed by a compressed air pulse. And then residual dust escaping. If dust has gotten into the clean air plenum because of a dropped or torn bag, hole in the tube sheet, or any of the other things we've discussed previously, the pulsing air may stir up the dust and allow it to escape into the clean air exhaust after each pulse. Residual dust may also be driven down inside filter bags by the pulsing air. If the filter bags are filled with several inches of dust, clean both the clean air plenum and the bag cage assemblies to avoid further problems. And then what if you feel like you're getting shorter filter bag life than you previously have or than you're expecting? The main things are temperature. Operating temperature above the recommended limit of the filter bag material will decrease the life. Chemical attacks. Bag material degrades due to attacks from certain chemicals in the dust or gas stream. That's why it's so important, as the chart before, to pick the right media to make sure that you're compliant and you're not having any issues. High moisture content in the collector may cause certain bag materials to shrink or degrade more rapidly. If it's wet and then it dries, it becomes more brittle and it becomes uh, shrinks and makes be tighter and maybe more hot. Uh, Localized abrasion. Abrasion of bags at the top of the cuff may occur due to incorrect installation. If you have your pulse pressure too high or your pulse pulsing too often, each pulse has an impact on the filter life. If you're pulsing at a high, high pressure, you will have, you will wear your bags much faster. Cages gone bad, corroded, rusted, or broken filter bag cages may cause excessive bag wear. Stainless steel or coated cages are available go for. And lastly, what if your filter bags are rubbing together? Bags may be rubbing against each other or against the interior of the dust collector. Illinois so troubleshooting. If the valve will not open, it will cause this. Or well, there's no power to the timer or solenoids or a faulty step in the timer. What's the solution? Check wiring. You may need a new timer board. The solenoid coil continuity is bad. You got to replace the coil. Build up the debris in the solenoid. Clean it. You want to check clean or replace the plunger if you can't clean it out and it doesn't work. Tubing between the solenoid valve is blocked. You're going to have to remove or install the correct tubing. 
solenoid plunger warm, replace plunger. Holes in the diaphragm, you want to replace the diaphragm. Block exhaust ports, remove the blockage carefully and not damage the rest of the solenoid. What is available not closed? It's leaking air. The solenoid leaks air, usually you're going to rebuild or replace the solenoid. The tubing between the solenoid and pulse valve leaks, you're going to replace the tubing and or connectors or tighten if needed. Solenoid energized continuously, you're going to check the power. If most likely you're going to have a timer board issue in this case. Insufficient air supply, check compressor supply lines, add the headers, properly sized. If there's a bad seal on the diaphragm, lightly tap the housing near the bleed ports to release the blockage or disassemble the valve and clean it out and make sure there's no oil or debris or anything in there left to put it back in there. And lastly, if there's a broken diaphragm spring, you want to have to replace the diaphragm kit. So, last thing we have here is just some examples that Jeff will kind of go over of some installations that we have previously. Thanks, Brian. Yep, uh, I'll run through these very quickly. These are just examples of uh, some actual installations. Here's an 88,000 ACFM multi-compartment collector. As you can see, it's got three different compartments with three hoppers under each compartment. These are uh, This is a high temperature application utilizing PTFE membrane on 22 ounce fiberglass bags. And the units also are outside and they have four inches of insulation with aluminum cladding. This is a TBR with lift off roof doors as well. The next one is a cartridge collector. This is a 5000 ACFM fume and lint application. Has 12 horizontal cartridges in a single compartment with a single hopper. And you can see it discharges to a 55 gallon drum uh, with a, and it's kind of hard to see, but there is a slide gate there and a what's called a drum cover kit. And this particular unit is also venting to atmosphere up through the stack, up through the roof. Um, last example here is a 22,000 ACFM a roofing manufacturer application, outdoors installation. Uh, kind of hard to see, and I apologize, but there is a doghouse high inlet. So the inlet is not coming into the hopper, but it is coming into the upper part of the dirty air plenum. Um, there's 196 polyester filter bags in this unit. Again, it's a TBR with lift-off roof doors. And it has a discharge connected to a cyclone separator. And, of course, uh, there's also um, the venting is to the atmosphere since it's an outdoor application. And that will wrap up the examples. Thank you, Jeff and Brian. Really appreciate that. Very thorough. Uh, we're going to do uh, two really quick questions since we're over, already over on time. Just a reminder that uh, you need to have been here for 50 minutes and you need to pass the test here to get the PDH. Uh, and to do both of those, you go to those last two widgets and you're going to need to take a look and uh, make sure that you're tracking there as well as you can print out your certificate from that widget when you have everything completed. So real quickly, take a couple questions here. Can you ever have a wet and dry system together? So you can, but not really recommended. Uh, keep in mind what we were just finished talking about is dust collection is typically for uh, dry dust. You, know, you never want to intertwine the two. Um, I guess it's possible that some plants may decide to filter certain dust through a dry dust collector and possibly filter some other type of uh, dust off of a process through a wet. Um, but you certainly would never want to have them be together. Uh, they certainly need to be um, uh, as far apart as possible. You never you want to keep moisture away from a dry dust collector as much as possible. Um, having a wet system uh, introduces uh, all other kinds of issues. How do you deal with the water, the slurry, et cetera? Uh, so for our intents and purposes here, we would only ever want to see a dry dust collector system installed and not, not together. Okay. And one more question here before we close out. And just a reminder, the platform will stay open for another 30 minutes so that people can finish up anything that they need to. So last question, and if we didn't get to your question again, don't worry about it. We do answer all the questions offline. We have your emails. We will definitely make sure that we answer any questions that you have asked. 
So can a dust collector handle above 500 degrees? Yes, it can, and special considerations need to be um, taken into account for the filter media. If you saw back on that chart, we really uh, only address temperatures up to 500, but above 500 you get into very custom type bags, maybe a ceramic type bag or even a Gore-Tex type bag, very, very expensive. Um, you also have to have considerations possibly for the paint application uh, on the unit, uh, insulation, et cetera, but yes. The short answer is they can handle above 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. All right. Thank you, Brian and Jeff, for a great presentation today. And I want to thank everybody here for attending. And um, we hope to see you again for some future events. We do have another one that is happening in May. I believe it's May 26th. And it's going to be on pumps and water and wastewater applications. Uh, the uh, invitation and registration for that is actually on the SECO, SECO certified website, so SECOcertified.com. Feel free to go over there and register for that event, or you will get an invite here in the near future. So thank you again for attending. We're going to go quiet, but the platform will stay live for another 30 minutes. And don't forget, here's all the things you need to do to get your certificate. And thank you again for coming, and take care. Bye-bye.